Right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, President Kucheru. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm very pleased to have a, a nice gathering of uh, visitors here, here tonight. And they've all obviously all come along because our beloved Skipper is going to say a few words. <laughs> Most people around this table are all sound with, 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 with Martin. So I'd like to introduce them. I want to start with uh, David. No, stay there, David. Stay there, David. <laughs> Mr. Don't, President, don't... can I perhaps uh, bring the greetings of the President of the Rotary Club of Croydon Jubilee uh, and say how nice it is to be with you? Thank you. Thank you. David, uh, is, as he says, is a visiting Rotarian and is also a past Commodore of the Little Ship Club that you often heard me uh, speak about. Uh, Sue, Sue Lyons, has also very, has been very active with the Little Ship Club in uh, the administration and set up the, uh, lots of uh, uh, events. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike Robry, uh, is a retired major uh, uh, who's also with our Brigadier, I understand, for many years in Germany, when they were stationed in, in Germany. And, uh, we sailed quite a bit, and I won't talk about when he turned the yacht upside down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sink <laughs> my... <laughs> 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 and, uh, Richard Reader, as uh, an RYA instructor, he, um, actually uh, 12 years ago, uh, I went on uh, one of Richard's course for Yacht Master for, for six months, and, and somehow another he passed me. Well, and, and I do like Richard because he can make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jamie, I, I think <laughs> most of us know uh, the uh, late uh, Bert Evans' uh, nephew, uh, and uh, is, is actually going on this current moment on a training course with Richard, doing the day skipper uh, course. Yeah, and uh, that's a six-month event yeah. as well. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> My grandson, George. Good night. His father, good of course, man. is Warren. I think most of us have, have met Warren or, 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 or know uh, Warren. And Richard, Richard. Another Richard. Another Richard. Who uh, I've only sailed with once. I don't think he's ever going to sail with me again. But <laughs> <laughs> we sailed recently from uh, Rome to Nice in, in, in France. Thank you. I'd like you to thank uh, my guests for coming along. Uh, Brigadier Martin Roberts, OEB sailor, <laughs> and Fuller <laughs> Speaker German. Uh, most, a lot of you obviously know him already. Um, Colin very kindly did a, a spiel for me here, and to introduce Martin, who was a retired brigadier, and was once stationed with the army in Germany, not war than once, I believe, uh, and it's, that's why he speaks German almost as well as I do. <laughs> in the army, Martin was in the signals, and when he retired from the army, he joined the top management uh, with various companies and many other BP. Um, and uh, that was all due to the experience and knowledge he gained whilst in the army uh, in the signals. Uh, the last 10 years, he's been fully retired and has sailed much in the northern hemisphere. And on many occasions, he was dressed the same with Colin. But, uh, Colin being a big man, <coughs> when he's on his ship, I think, on the boat, has uh, a camera He does. Without any further ado, please, I welcome to Stories about Colin, and I'll do my very best to come. As your webmaster, you've probably done masses of films on the, on the internet, and I'm not going to bother showing any of the films that you can look up about his life. Anyway, Colin has been sailing with us for on 13 trips now since uh, he started with us in 2007. So, now, this you'll recognize as Hadrian. This is the statue of Hadrian that was pulled out of the River Thames, not very far from here. Uh, about 30 years ago. Moving on to the next slide quickly, you'll see all, this is the area that, that um, Hadrian ruled over. And of course, Hadrian came to England in uh, AD 117, and of course he built Hadrian's Wall. Of course, I come from the other side of the Hadrian's Wall. Yeah. My message behind this is that the point is that Hadrian was an emperor, went to visit virtually his whole, whole area, and was probably the most traveled empire, emperor of the Roman, Roman world. He, he gave up the bit down here, wise man that he was, and brought them, they walked the boundary back to, uh, to, 
Judea and so on. <laughs> My message from this slide is that in fact we've sailed all this area, Colin has sailed virtually all the way around here, and we're going to be talking about that the various places. He's done 13 trips with us, so uh, we'll move on to the next one. The first trip he did with us was with David Lewis and uh, Bight as well, and this was back in uh, 2007. We started off in Sicily, we sailed to the bottom end of, of uh, Corsica and on to, to um, Minorca and to Mallorca. I mean, I'm not going to say very much on that because there are some more things, but this is a typical thing. Once Colin gets on the wheel, you never get him off. Yeah. 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 He takes, oh, take, tries to take control. Yeah. There's David giving him his map reading instructions, moving on to the next slide. Here we are, a picture of actually doing some useful work. He's actually yeah. 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 David, of course, tying up there. This is the boat we had in those days, it's a Bavaria 38, which was basically the Volkswagen of the sailing industry, made in Germany, all, all very standard, very simple boat. Uh, we did 40,000 miles with her eventually, uh, including crossing the Atlantic a couple of times, uh, and uh, she had on board three cabins, and we can sleep uh, seven people comfortably on board. Um, so that's the, moving on to the next slide. Here we are, typical view, sailing downwind with the spinnaker up, with the mainsail and the genoa. Uh, and when the weather, weather's like that, it's a great fun and great pleasure and, and so on. Moving on, here we are at the end of that particular trip. There's Mike Robris and, and, and uh, David Lewis over here. And Colin with a little bit of sun tan there. <laughs> <laughs> Having had good weather and so on. Basically, I change my crew every two weeks because we're, you know, fishing guests now after three days type principle. So we change our crew after two weeks, and we, I sail mostly for about three or four months every every summer. So moving on now to the uh, the, end, the end of the trip, we first up in Mahan. Now I'm going to tell you about Mahan. There's, there's a uh, in the Seven Years' War of 1756. You might remember a guy called Admiral Bing got shot on his on his, um, on his flagship, and. Um, this was because, um, prior to that point of history, the, the Royal Navy had a series of admirals who were rather functive. And this character, uh, Bing, was put in charge to go and relieve a fort in, in, in the north called Port St. Philippe. And quite frankly, he failed to do it properly. And his own officers actually testified against him at his court martial. So he was shot on his own flagship, and he actually gave the sign himself. He had to drop the handkerchief himself when he got shot. So. Um, from that experience, the Royal Navy then moved on, and hence, when they got to the Fargo and so on, everybody fought because they knew if they got it wrong, this might happen to them too. So we're moving on. But now we're going on to 2008. We've sailed across the Atlantic, and Colin joins us uh, in Antigua, which is this island group here. And then we sailed from Antigua to Nevis, to St. Kitts, went to Stacia, uh, Guadeloupe, St. Martin. Uh, that's where he bought uh, Carol, a lovely diamond brooch, and then we sailed from there back to Anguilla, which we're going to come on to very shortly. So that, that's the top end of the, of the Leeward Islands, which we're, we're going all the way down to down to Trinidad. So moving on to the next photograph, here's Colin arriving in Antigua with his bright coloured shirt. He's always, always full of colour in the things he wears. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is English Harbour where Nelson was based back in the 18, 1790s and so on. Here we are, the colour being followed by some of his supporters, this time sheep and cattle. <laughs> <laughs> one of the colours are next. Uh, moving on. Um, this is now one of Nevis, which was one of the next island after Antigua. The thing about Nevis is that this is where uh, Nelson met his wife, uh, Fanny, uh, who he eventually he married. She was a widow, she'd lost, uh, and uh, she had a son by her, her husband who died. Uh, and he went to Nevis because he suffered from back problems. And he went there because there were hot springs. And this is a beautiful hot springs where um, Nelson would bathe and all the rest of it. Anyway, the net result was he, he finished up marrying her. Uh, and uh, it, this is before, obviously before when he was still a young captain and, and was very successful. Uh, here's the thing coming up. Now, this is good. This is now moving on to the next time, the station. Uh, during the, the American War of Independence of the uh, 1780s, um, the <coughs> Americans smuggled a lot of things in from uh, areas uh, of Europe and so on, weapons and so on and so on. And we had put a blockade up, and the blockade was pretty effective. So the only way around it was people to smuggle things Ill illegally. So this island station, which was a Dutch island, uh, had a population there, and um, we eventually captured this island in 1785. Admiral Rodney was there, uh, and uh, Rod, Rod, moving on to the next slide, 
the Rod Moon and Norton seemed to be a very large number of funerals taking place on the island. He couldn't understand why. So eventually, he dug up one of the, the most recent funerals and discovered that in the graveyard, there were all the gold and treasures. They'd been hiding all the money they'd been making for the profits of selling, break, breaking all the, all the, uh, the trade regulations that were running. And, and there were, anyway, there was all that. We got, got all the, not the money back. So that was that. Then, now, one of Colin's great skills, not, is cooking. Um, here he is cooking. That's my wife uh, giving advice. I'd be very surprised, I have to say. But there's Colin holding two frying pans. Like frying pans. I don't think he's actually using it to cook. He's probably using it to make noise more than anything else. But uh, one of the great things about Colin, he also likes his chilies. So we always had to have hot chilies with the things. And he'll tell you all about his chilies that he grows at home in his, in his greenhouse. But he does occasionally cook, and there you are, with the help of ladies. And he always takes advice from the ladies as to how they produce these wonderful meals and so on. So moving on, um, here we are now, in, we're now in uh, St. Martin. And St. Martin, of course, is uh, half Dutch and half French. And that's where you bought Carol, mm -hmm. you might remember that lovely diamond brooch, which you have asked yeah. for advice on and so on and so forth. Uh, I think you're going there again, and the, or you've just been there. You've just been there. Yeah. And so on. So that's uh, <coughs> Martin, that's the boat, and again you can see the mast, the sails, the wind generator, all the safety equipment on the back. We'd already crossed the Atlantic at this stage, so we're, we're, we're now sort of thinking about going back. Uh, moving on, here we are, we're now f finishing the cruise on that particular one, there's a place called Anguilla. Now Anguilla, where you will probably remember, hit the British headlines in 1971. Because uh, back in the 1960s, we were under pressure to get rid of a lot of our British colonies. And we formed the group of Anguilla and St. Kitts and Nevis into a, a separate group and tried to make them independent. And eventually, um, this report came back of uh, all sorts of unpleasant things happening in Anguilla. Turned out to be an absolute non-event. But anyway, the point was that we deployed the parachute regiment. There you are, there's a red berry on the end of the machine guns. There's a say that the soldiers are, are relaxing. But and we earned back the, the military up with the police who are seen here in the next portion. <laughs> city of London Police. Uh, so there you are, there's 900 City of London Police, and at least five of them were on duty on Anguilla for, for, for several months while we tried to run the ball with it. And we landed on Anguilla, we went down and saw all the remains of all that. So that was that. Uh, just to finish on that story, the end of that particular cruise, we finished up in, uh, in Anguilla, and then the Colin and my wife and Another friend flew back to Antigua to get fly back to UK and British Airways. Unfortunately, when they got there, they discovered the aircraft had been fully booked, overbooked, in fact. So Colin and my wife were then offered um, money if they agreed and accommodation to stay the night, if they stayed on until the next day and took the next flight back. Now, Colin's never one to miss a chance to make a bit of money. <laughs> on this occasion, he took this offer. And it was all going very well. So my wife says, until they discovered they were both meant to be sharing the same bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> he was a gentleman, he did, and B, B A were very good, and actually gave him two separate rooms. And you got your money, and you, and you got the flight back, and that was a, anyway. My wife was very grateful for the 50 quid that you got for the cash extra for, for, for <laughs> staying on. Now, the next time we met up with Colin, was the, we then crossed the Atlantic. Sue was on the leg going, going, going back. We then um, arrived in the Azores. And this is the main point. There are nine islands in the Azores. This is the main island. And Colin joined us in here. We then sailed from there uh, back to England, back to uh, Land's End, to, to, to Penzance, and then eventually into, uh, into Farmer. Uh, and um, moving on to the next slide. Colin, of course, we're exploring all the historical things in, in uh, Fire, which is the capital island. And there he is in charge of the chamber, you would think, moving on. But of course, he's the only one there as ever. He's a grand in charge of the but lovely location. And if you ever get a chance, go, do go visit the Azores. They're actually very lovely islands. And moving on, here we are. We're now, we have, we have we, we established friendships with all sorts of boats. This is a lovely lady whose husband was sitting here, I should point out. Uh, and this is the boat called, from the boat called Sea Squared. And we sailed with them all the way across the Atlantic and back again. But the point is that we had a Colin organised a sing song. I mean, we have got, if you look at the internet, you'll find the most appalling sing song <laughs> taking place with Colin photograph. We were all completely out of tune, but again, thank you, Colin, for setting up that <laughs> event. Here we are, Colin, again. Now we're now on our way back to the Azores. 
uh, to England. And on the next photograph, you will see, I hope, uh, there's the route we we've, 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 we've started off, we've, we came out from here, we sailed down, crossed the Atlantic, did the Caribbean all around there, came up to Bermuda, across the Atlantic again, into the Azores, then from the Azores came all the way back, back to uh, the farmers. So moving on to the next photograph. On the way back, we bumped into a whole lot of these boats. There were about 40 of these boats. These are single-handed boats, one person on board, uh, normally about 26 feet long, uh, with all sorts of safety equipment, like white orange things and with automatic steering and so on the back. And this was a race taking place from, uh, from, from Falmouth down to the Azores and back again, so they could qualify to take part in the race across the Atlantic, which was going to take place in about three months after that. I think 42 boats took part in that. We were quite astonished because um, these people were, you have to sleep. How do you sleep? Well, the answer is they've got their doors. They have, and they, you hope that nobody's going to hit you. But every now and then, <laughs> it is, a, it is a, they have various devices for helping. But we did have a lot of fun. And moving on to the next photograph, we actually spoke to one of them. Uh, this is not a slight out of sequence, but this, this is how they lived. In a very narrow space with all the bits of wiring and cooking and uh, technology to try and help them and sleep and so on. I take them at sea for two weeks and they probably sleep for about two or three hours a night or for two or three weeks in, in, in their crossing. And so on. So, moving on. Uh, right, we then, so I guess right, go sorry. back one. Now, here we are, this, this is inside our yacht. There's a double cabin at the front, which is the one that Colin normally occupied. Um, and then we had a, there's a Two other double cabins, and there's Sue, obviously, and another guy called John Welling, who's one of our regular sailors. Uh, a typical meal at sea, non slip mat in case the boat's rolling back and forward. Everything's held up by bits of, uh, of uh, string to make sure nothing flies loose and so on. We didn't turn, we've never turned the boat upside down. Mike, sitting there, the <laughs> was at the helm of a yacht once. We actually rolled the boat upside down, did a 360. Um, provided you've got your various safety things in place, it's not a major problem. Um, provided you've got your hatches closed and you've got safety harnesses on. And that's exactly what happened to Mike, because Mike describes the story how he looked up and you can see the sky above that the harness was on and the boat eventually came up and Mike's here today, so there you are. Anyway, that's a sort of typical version when we're sailing at sea and going along. Moving on to the next one. As we approached Falmouth, we ran into some quite thick fog and Colin was on the helm. In fact, it was during the middle of the night, I mean, we're talking about ten days at sea, so we've had ten, nine nights at sea, and Colin was doing his stag, and he, he called for help. We, we, we were sailing with one person on the helm and three people sleeping, so we were doing about an hour and a half on and then four, four and a half hours sleeping. So. Anyway, Colin called for help because um, uh, we were now into thick fog, there were lights everywhere, with a fishing fleet and all the rest of it. Anyway, the net result was that we saw other people being rescued, but mercifully it wasn't us, so there you are. But there you are, there's a helicopter picking somebody up in the lifeboat in order to it. Moving on to the last picture of that series. We arrived in Falmouth and the friends from our sailing the little ship club came out. Toy box came out to greet us and we were very grateful to see them. And they welcomed us in. They passed over a bottle of champagne to us and that quickly went down for them, didn't it? <laughs> and here we are, there's uh, putting up the flags at the end of the thing, having done the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers, Atlantic Rally for Cruisers Europe. And various uh, those are club flags flying up there and so on. Moving on, right. We then moved on to next year. That, we finished that race at that uh, sail in, in Falmouth. The next year we then set off from uh, from Plymouth, and we were going to the Scilly Isles. And this is the crew. The, the, the Isles are silly. The Isles are silly. Uh, <laughs> uh, are silly. There is uh, Colin, Sue, Mike. And myself, what you do the photograph? Well, I was taken by Fenolia, and that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're, set, we're setting off. It was actually jolly cold that day. We went round Land's End, <laughs> moving on. Um, we eventually arrived at the Isles of City. Here we are, Mike uh, at Tresco, moving on. There's me at Tresco, various statues and so on. And the wonderful gardens if you get to get to the city at the Isles of City. And here we are at uh, an Easter Sunday going to church on, on the local island at Greyhound. Oh, yeah. So that's moving on to that. Then we arrived in Cork, and this is, uh, again, that was a cold sail. You can see there's Mike and his boat. And there's the name of the boat at Malorum, uh, and the column was all part of that. And then you then flew back from, from Cork, moving on to the next one. We, of course, arrived in Cork. This is also the Titanic. But it, its last port of call, and this was going to be not our last port of call, because we were going to go up around the west coast of Ireland, which is exactly what we did. 
So that was the end of that. <coughs> Moving on to the next slide. We're now, next year after that, we're now in the Baltic. We're now talking about, uh, here is uh, Kiel, and we're going up around Kiel and eventually up towards St. Petersburg into Russia. That's what we did eventually. But Colin joined us at Lubeck, which was here. We sailed along the coast. He had. He, he, he quite often comes on his birthday. He comes on his birthday is the 31st of July, 1944. If you want to know that, that's uh, there it is. But when we were in, in, in here, we had two things of interest. One is that what we, had, we were joined by German uh, Graf Christian von Bortmeier, uh, moving on to the photograph. Uh, that's uh, boarding in Lübeck, moving on from there. Here we are in Lübeck town, you recognize the Lübeck Martin uh, and so on, moving on. Uh, here we are, Christian von Bortmar, he picked us up uh, at the airport. lovely man, very good friends of ours, and uh, his next photograph, this is the house that used to belong to the family, it's now what was in the former East Germany. Yeah. His great, great, great grandfather was the advisor to George I when he came over to England mm -hmm. in 1710 and lived in Downing Street was, was where the Jer where this the boat my family lived before it became 10 Downing Street and the residence of our Prime Minister. So moving on from that, here we are, was also on board with Chapel Nick Williams. Colin is looking very smile because he's just been celebrating his birthday. We were in, <laughs> in um, Baramunda at that stage. We managed to get uh, him into town. We got um, him up on the platform. We got a band to play. We got fireworks provided and everything else. And he was grossly embarrassed. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Really, really great. Uh, moving on, we're now heading. We're now heading <coughs> east. We're now oh, yeah. at Pinamunda. This is where the V the V1 was built and the V2 was built and various other sort of weapon systems that were built there. So we're exploring, our, exploring this amazing site. And of course apart from the sadness behind all the missiles coming over to our country during the Second World War. It was also the startering of the, of the American rocket program because the people who were here from Brunson all went to America and helped start off the American program. <coughs> the Russians also got quite a few of the scientists as well. So moving on, here we are in, in, in uh, Pinamunda. There's all the various sites, the power station. It's quite a big site. It's quite a big location. Uh, moving on from there. We've now sort of come around from here. We're now going on to Gdansk. To uh, this is the top end of Poland. Um, you've got Sweden up there, of course, and then you're up into the Baltic around here. And of course, up here comes Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Anyway, we sailed along here, and uh, we had quite a rough passage there. And you wouldn't let go the helm, thank goodness, because two of the crew were going violently seasick for most of the time. But then anyway, we eventually arrived in Gdansk. Moving on. Um, here where is Collins putting up the, when you arrive in a country you have to fly the flag of that country, the courtesy flag. And this is Colin putting up the Polish courtesy flag. So on from there. Here we are. Now one of the things Colin loves to do is to play cards. He thinks he's quite good at it, but he doesn't always win. In fact, he doesn't win very often. And here we are, getting ready. There's the cards being lined up. There's Nick looking, working out what they're going to take off Colin. And, uh, and you can see we're all quite sunburned at this stage with, this, with, this, with, with the wind and so on. Moving on, here we are now, we've now arrived in Gdansk. You've seen this <laughs> t-shirt before today in, in, uh, in Antigua. But the point about the Gdansk, it's, it's, um, it used to be called Danzig. It was an international port. It was where the Second World War began, where the Germans first the went into open fire and all the rest of it and so on. And uh, they have this drink here where they serve golden, golden, uh, golden, wa golden water. It's a sort of mixture of alcohol and bits of gold, gold leaf. Uh, which is quite special. So there we are, Colin had his fair share of that. David joined <laughs> us there as well. Sue joined us there later on too. Moving on. Um, here we are, Colin exploring all the things in the prison. Didn't get locked up, moving on. Um, here we are in Danzig itself, the centre of the town, beautiful location. Uh, there's the old town. This city was flattened in the Second World War and it's been completely rebuilt. It's a beautiful town. If you have a chance, do go and visit Gdansk. It, I mean, they've also rebuilt uh, um, the capital of Warsaw, or Warsaw. But here's our boat, again, the same boat. Moving on, uh, we're now going on to the next leg, which was uh, a year later. Colin joined us in Helsinki. We've been to St. Petersburg. We've been up to the, to the Samai Lakes up in Finland. We've been around all these areas, Riga. This is all after Ransom country, of course. And we're sailing from Helsinki uh, to various islands and then on to Stockholm. On to, on to Stockholm. So we're moving on. Here we are. David's on board, jumping over the bow. Uh, not the easiest thing to do. But then that's our boat moving on. 
And here we are, Colin, with the inevitable camera in his hand, doing his duty for Mick, providing all the films for your website. Moving on. Now, this is a place called Bomersund, which exists today. It's a big fort. It's, a, it's in ruins now, but in those days, it, this part of uh, Finland was, was run by the Russians. <coughs> and um, the thing, why it was so important was that the part of this is where the, the Crimean War, believe it or not, began. The Crimean War, obviously, um, was on the Black Sea, but the, the major naval effort was actually in the Baltic. And here we are looking at it, moving on to the next one. We've moored now, there are our boats moored at, at Bombersund, moving on. Here is a picture of, of the ship called HMS Hecker in June 19, 1854, <coughs> bombarding the fort, we've not seen that earlier on. And uh, in this particular incident, uh, the Russians had, had invented cannonballs that actually exploded, that had fuses attached. Up to this point, before this war, they just fired two round shot. Anyway, in this particular war, they fired ones with fuses, and a gentleman by the name of Lucas picked up one, threw it overboard, and exploded as it went over the side. He, he was lucky, he wasn't injured, nobody was injured, and he got awarded the Royal Humane Society's Medal. Very noble, very good. Anyway, when Queen Victoria, two years later, decided to have the Victoria Cross, um, he was the first person to get the Victoria Cross. Um, moving on to the next picture, now, the Victoria Cross is made from cannons captured in Sebastopol in the Crimea. But they, when you they're made of bronze, and when a cannon's been fired, you can't rework the metal. If you can't make anything else with it. But the bits of the cannon that are not have not been uh, used are these two bits called the trunnions, and this one's missing a bit of a trunnion, and the bit at the back called the ball, uh, where it's uh, again under pressure, uh, is not under any uh, firing pressure, and that's what's used was used to make the Victoria Crosses. Now, we ran out of our material for making Victoria Crosses in, in 1925. And so our engine scientists went down to Woolwich to see if they could find any other cannons they could use to make, replace the thing. But they discovered that these cannons were actually made of bronze made in China. And it turned out that the Russians had actually bought these cannons from the Chinese. And so we were able to use another cannon that was up at, at uh, Woolwich uh, that, had been, that we captured in the Second Chinese War. So you are not history, you don't call that right. Moving on. <coughs> Here's Colin and Party Wood. It must have been his birthday. Champagne. We, will, we always try to make fun for it. For and there is a lady called Emma who was on that Emmy who had no and that cruise. We always try to have one lady on board because it adds a, adds a degree of civilization on, 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 on the community. Moving on. And here we are at the end of the thing in, in Stockholm. This is particularly tragic because this was just after the Norwegian gentleman with the name, I was looking up part of my cue card, the gentleman who um, carried out the massacre in Norway, if you remember, <laughs> Anders Bering, um, age 33, who killed 77 people in, in Oslo and then on the town. We, were, we, we knew nothing about it until we went through the centre of Stockholm. There were these memorials and candles burning and so on. Uh, so moving on from that, here we are saying goodbye to the crew, moving on, we're catching the train, and then this is the next leg, um, we're now, says he's looking hard, trying to remember exactly where it is, we're now, yes, we're now leaving Brighton, we're now back in England, we'll come back to Brighton, here's Colin at the helm, we're heading across to France, moving, leaving Brighton Marina, sailing out to Brighton Marina, uh, there's Colin happy and smiling, and the next photograph was fascinating, because we then went into the thickest fog we probably ever had. And we, we went, luckily, we found, thanks to uh, the G, GPS, we found the light ship in the middle of the, of the cha English Channel. But 100 yards away, we couldn't see it, and then we were spot on. And we carried on to a place called Facon. Colin now <laughs> decides to kiss for luck. This is a, a statue of a lady called St. Andrew. Andrew and what, if you kiss the footprint, you got luck. So Colin has had his share of luck, and you kissed the footprint. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing of interest in Bacon, apart from the fact that, that, that um, um, Worm the Conqueror came from there, was that they made a wonderful group called Benedictine. Uh, and uh, oh, yeah. a lot of people drank a lot of Benedictine. In fact, Colin got quite a few bottles of Benedictine. Yes. <laughs> Moving on, this is the effect on one of the crew members. At <laughs> <laughs> end of the day, so we're carrying on. Here we are, we then climbed to the top of the hill, there's Sue, there's John, there's, there's Colin, and this is the church to, to commemorate sailors and so on. Um, and then we carried on down there, down to um, uh, the end of, the, to, to um, Enfleur, 
and I'm going to work your way on to the next coast. On to, here we are arriving at Pegasus Bridge. Oh. Oh, now, yeah. Pegasus Bridge is on the river, on the canal Incredible. that goes up the oh. top where the bio tapestry is. But it's also very important because during D-Day operations, um, it, uh, moving on to the next photograph, Various people from the parachute regiment landed by, par by glider. Three gliders landed on top, almost on top of the bridge. And this was the first house to be liberated in France. Um, you can see this was the first house to be liberated, and the docks and bucks were, that, who were infantry in, the, in these gliders under the chapel of John Howard. So that was very interesting. Moving on, we then passed along the beaches. Here you've got the Mulberry Harbors uh, at Aramanche. That's looking from the seaside. See, uh, these were the the, the boats, they put the, the barges, they sank <laughs> behind the, the breakwater, and inside that they built a harbour, which you can now see from the next picture. There is the remains of the harbour and the walls and so on and so forth. The Americans had one too, but they didn't anchor theirs properly. So when the storm came up on the, about the 11th of June, theirs got washed out. And this harbour provided all the supplies <coughs> for, for all the troops in, in both British and American and Canadian. We're now moving on to. Uh, the next following year, and, and we're, we're now sailing around this part of the world. This is now Brest. We, did, we, we went all the way around here, uh, and we had a couple of trips which took us from Brest into Duarmany and all that sort of area around here. <coughs> Nothing of any great excitement. We'll just quickly go through um, where we went, and that's Brest. This is where the French nuclear submarines are based, and we saw, we'll come on to the saw one over there. We went up the river here and went and, and saw the various people up there, and then we came down and spent the winter in Duan and A. We also went out to Ashen, which is the island at the end of the English Channel. You've got the Isles of Scilly up here and Ashen here. That's quite often the, the start of all this timing for the Blue Ribbon, all the ships trying to break records and so on. And then, of course, you've got the lovely French coastline down here. Moving on, there's Colin again playing with food at the, at the galley, doing his bit, and moving on. Uh, here we are on the island of Ashant, Mike and John Welling. A thing of interest about this lighthouse is that they also, the lighthouse, very important lights, the first lighthouse you, you meet as you come from the New World. But they have a bell that's underwater, so when ships want to know where they were, they ring they, this thing in fog, they, this bell would ring, and you could work out where you were by working out the time and everything else. Moving on, there are French nuclear submarine assault, some of those. Moving on. Uh, here we are, winter quarters in Duan and Eight, moving on. Um, uh, now, after the next trip for the next year, we then sailed from there across to England, moving on. And here we are, we, Colin wanted to go, we weren't heading to the sea that David was on board. Mike, you were on board too, and Sue was on board, that's right. We, all went, we were heading up to Falmouth to uh, this party, which Colin, one of Colin's best friends was organising. So we sailed all the way across from the north of France to go to this party, we had a bloody good party. Then we sailed all the way back again to France to uh, Roscoff, where we discovered all about Onion Johnny. Onion Johnny is a people used to come across and, and around, cycling around here in, 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 in southern England, selling onions. And these were the pink onions that uh, used to be terribly popular. I mean, I can remember these people in Edinburgh yeah. cycling around on, on bicycles and so on. Anyway, we saw the history of all that. And here we are with this common fendering. We went into uh, uh, the, the up a canal and, and fendering in the lock going through, uh, moving on. And then eventually Colin went back from Jersey. The crew change, we had a crew change in Jersey and flew back from there. So that's that moving on. We're now into Greece. We've now sailed the boat down to, 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 to the Mediterranean again. Uh, in fact, we're sorry, we sold the boat. That's right, this is the new boat. We sold that boat, that was that was that boat. This is now White Lady, this is two years ago. There's um, Colin and Mike, and we're now in Pervesa. Uh, go on, the next one. And at Pervesa was the Battle of Actium, which took place AD 37, and that's the battle between uh, um, Cleopatra uh, and uh, her lover, uh, and Octavius, who represented the other side of the Roman Empire. Biggest sea battle apparently ever in history. Thousands of ships involved, and of course, Cleopatra fled, and uh, the rest is history. So well, that, that's us sailing around there, moving on. We then had a problem. Our, our starter boat was burnt out. Now, Colin and Mike sailed the boat brilliantly while I tried to start the engine. We didn't realize at this stage that this thing had burnt out, and we attacked it. They attacked the boat and brilliantly into a little harbor of the sky. So that was that, moving on. 
And here we are, <coughs> we've been repaired, and so we did the sightseeing. That's a typical Greek island, but not the atmosphere. Colony is photographs moving on. And here we are, yet again, celebrating the good Greek food, which we did. It's actually very good and enjoyable. Moving on. Here we are, now arrived in the port of Patras. Now, the thing about Patras um, was that we arrived there in a very thick rainstorm, and Colin was on the helm. Now, Colin's only got one eye. You probably may or may not know that. But with that one eye, you can still see quite a lot of things. But this particular occasion, we couldn't see more than about 20 yards. Remember the spread yes, before we down? Yes, well. Uh, we, anyway, we decided not to enter until the rain stopped, and we eventually moved, and that, that's us who are in there as well. Okay. Um, now, the, moving on, we've now left Greece. We're now starting off the boat winter that year in, in uh, northern Greece, near Thessalonica. And this time, we're now sailing from Alexandropolis into the Dardanelles, and up through the Sea of Marmara, uh, calling off at uh, Istanbul. But this then takes you to Bulgaria and then up to uh, Romania. We then sail all the way along to the top end of Turkey. But Colin left at that point. So we're now setting off on the next one. This is now the Dardanelles. This is last year. This is the 100th anniversary of, of, the, of, the, of the Dardanelle campaign. And that's on the hillside. Now the, name, the, the Dardanelle campaign is in two parts. The first part was a naval campaign where the Navy should have stormed the channel. It was a brilliant idea. It was badly carried out. The Admiral who was in charge had a heart attack the day before the attack was launched. The minesweepers hadn't cleared the mines properly. And this little thing called the Nusrat, this Turkish uh, thing with German crews on board, relayed a lot of the mines. And the net result was that we lost about four battleships in, in a space of about two or three hours. We sailed in there, we actually moored the first French battleship and sunk the ship in Bobe. Moving on to the next picture. The, so the naval campaign failed, then the land campaign took part. Now, the, no question about it. The, the, the Anzac, Australian New Zealanders, have captured the highlights as regards the sacrifice and, the, and so on. But the, 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 the number of troops who died were mainly British. Something like 40,000, 50,000 British died, 10,000 French, 8,000 Australians, and 2,000 New Zealanders. We were there for the 100th anniversary. You can see they're just taking down the stands of the, all the VIP stands. Of the, this is a place called Lone Pine, which is on the east side as well. Moving on, there is Sue in the trench, looking at the, the restored trenches the Turks have built. But this is the, on the west side of the peninsula. And that's Subla Bay, which is where the second landings took place in the August. The first landings happened in the June. Uh, again, poor, poor communication, poor leadership, poor all sorts of things. But we didn't perform particularly well there. Moving on, this is us now going into the Sea of Marmara. There's white, li white lady moored alongside a French fishing boat. We had such hospitality, good hospitality, from the, uh, from the, the, uh, the Turks. Um, and they just were very friendly, very poor, but they gave us cups of tea and everything else and so on. So moving on from that, here we are more going up the, the, the side of the Sea of Marmara. The Sea of Marmara, of course, is the town, island of Marmara where marble comes from. So that's where the, where the Greeks originally got all their white marble. And then going on to the next one, there we are arriving in Istanbul. We were lucky, we were there before all the troubles began, so we had no big, big issues there at all. Uh, and then. This year, which was, um, the, the, this is the, now the 13th of the legs we've been on, we, Colin joined us in Rome, Porto de Roma, and we sailed up the coastline here to, uh, uh, to Elba eventually, and then from Elba we then crossed across to uh, San Remo, and to Monte Carlo, and then on to Nice. Um, so we'll move that quickly for these pictures. Here we're having, a, a, at the end of the first day, we've had a gale behind us, we've just arrived, uh, Colin, Sue, uh, Richard, um, all on board. Um, lowered bows too because of the very strong winds that we'd experienced. Moving on. Now, we arrived at the island of Gigliro. Uh, I show this on because Colin is a good when he's not, he spent, Colin has spent a year and his half, a year and half of his life sailing on yachts. He sailed 14,000 miles altogether, but he spends the rest of his time with Carol cruising on cruise ships. <laughs> so we always like to show this to Colin, just to remind him that cruise ships are just as vulnerable as yachts are. And this is the Costa Concordia, which hit a rock down the side here, and um, tapped the rock on that side, and sank. 
and uh, 28 people sadly lost their lives. The captain went to prison quite, quite rightly, uh, and that's the harbour entrance to, uh, to, 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 to the port. Now, this is to, that was the photo, that was the last photograph from the internet. This photograph, is, this is where the cruise ship sank, right here. And there's the harbour, the photograph I took over there. The rock they hit was around the corner there. And it, how that captain, well he wasn't, he wasn't on board, he was, well he was on board, but he wasn't at his, at his place, because he was, may or may not have been entertaining a young lady or something like that. But at that point, he wasn't doing his duty, and the ship got too close and hit a rock. And that rock we sailed past, and we actually rode beside it, and we went up and down. So, sights all around the time. A very interesting experience to see that. Moving on, um, so there we are, we've come from Giglio, we then, there's Monte Cristo, the county of Monte Cristo you've heard of, and we came up to various harbours, and then we went on to Elba. Now, the, Napoleon was sent there in 1815, 1814, in August 1814, when he surrendered at Fontainebleau. As it so happened, a guy called Colonel Colin McKenzie, was a, 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 Colin Campbell, was on, on, in Paris at the time and been injured. And so he was detailed to look after Napoleon to escort him down here. And so Napoleon became, was made the king of Elba. He was also given an island to look after as part of his empire, which gave him the right to have a ship. Anyway, on, in, in February 1815, Campbell, thinking that um, Napoleon was running out of money, went up to Livorno to write a letter to Castle, the foreign secretary, to say, look, I think the, the, the Bourbon kings in Paris were not paying him what he should be paid. Um, he sent his ship back to say he, he would be coming back to Navarro, but uh, uh, when he, the ship got back, discovered that Napoleon was lo loading up and had hired six other ships. So Napoleon plus six ships plus about a thousand people set sail from here, sailed past Capria, which was a prison island, and then went on up um, to, uh, to the south of France. Um, so let's go look at the photographs. This is the palace that, the, that Napoleon lived in. It's actually quite, it doesn't look very special outside. It's that, and the his Imperial Guard lived in this little fort up here, moving in. This is Napoleon's loo, would you believe? Uh, there is a photograph somebody, somewhere of somebody sitting there. I don't know if actually got that photograph. Um, so, anyway, there, there is um, Campbell, and he's uh, looking very smart. The system obviously looked after him because he finished up being a major general and he eventually gets out to be the sent to be the governor of Sierra Leone where he died of, uh, of malaria. Moving on to that, here we have Napoleon going aboard his ship um, with his, his six other boats and so on. There's his castle and so on. Going on and on the way on his ship, that's Napoleon's ship there, we passed a French warship that just literally it knew perfectly well what Napoleon was doing. They just sailed, sailed, sailed on. And uh, eventually Napoleon arrived in Jean Le Pen, the near next to Cannes, and uh, <coughs> no shot was fired, and the whole the whole, whole of his escape from uh, from from Elba. Moving on, we then sailed past uh, all these places. We then went to the north end of uh, of uh, Corsica, and we were moored here. And when, the night we moored up, there was there were a whole series of flags. Oh, what a Union Jack obviously flying there. Anyway, this is the morning of the referendum result. And Brexit has now been announced. This flag, somebody in the harbour turned this flag upside down. <laughs> it's a sign of uh, distress and everything else and so on. We were quite, quite smooth. But otherwise, people were very, very calm and calm, calm about it. Moving on very quickly now. We then went on to San Remo, and then we eventually arrived in Monaco. This is Monaco. There's the main harbour. This is Mr. Green and his, his yacht and his wife and everything else down there. And we're we're more of the little yacht, yacht harbour down here. The palace is up here, I think. Lovely spot. I mean, the, we were well looked after there. Moving on. Here we are, uh, Colin filming yet again in Mon Monaco. Moving on. Um, and here is Colin in one of his favourite places, the casino. <laughs> Colin started life off, as you probably, many of you probably know, involved in making gaming machines or repairing gaming machines. So he was in his element here, the only thing is that those machines are the mechanical ones, which he was expert at, have all been replaced by electrical ones. Anyway, that was Colin on the, uh, in the casino. And then um, we finished up in Nice, and that's, this is my last slide on Nice, and this is basically the spot where um, three days after we left there, the man drove the lorry into the crowd and we all tried to So we've seen a bit. 
Colin, that's all I want to say. That's a little bit of your life, <laughs> life at sea with, uh, with the family. We hope you'll carry on sending boats over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. No, because you, that's in, in, in um, the Crimea, yes. at that stage, so you were I'd already, I had planned to go to the Crimea, but we were not allowed to go to Crimea because it was at the south end of the, of the Crimea. Yeah. Was, yeah. Had I gone the year before, we would have bad management, yeah. we were able to sadly. Yeah. We went to a place called Sinop, which is due south, <coughs> and Sinop had electronic warfare stations all the listening in. You can you imagine, there's obviously, the distances are not very great, but 90 miles across. Yeah. No, we didn't. Okay. Yes. I seem to remember when I was in France, certain access to the press and the uh, nuclear station there was pretty much a uh, uh, prohibitive and difficult to get to. Is that that's still the case now? We were within 100 yards of the nuclear submarines and nobody bothered us. Oh, well. um, I mean, there was one submarine that moored up and we, we actually anchored. In fact, we, Richard, you were moored at the time. We tried to anchor. Um, quite, that's what we tried. Remember, we tried to anchor we couldn't get the anchor down. And so, on. so the answer was they were much more relaxed about it. I mean, this was it was three years ago that one of our submarines and that particular one bumped into each other in the Atlantic. Because at that stage, we weren't telling them where we were going; they weren't telling us where we were going. And because these submarines are so quiet, I mean, every, every, the company's all plastic; they all wear trick gym shoes and so on. They were so so quiet; they didn't hear each other, and they, were, they eventually bumped into each other and did a bit of damage to one of them. Anybody else, please? Any questions? No? Can I please ask George? Mm -hmm. the water tank. Thank you. The first word um, that I wrote down um, was, well, uh, no wonder Colin likes going away. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, by the way, for all the ammunition you've now given us about uh, you know, the <laughs> His culinary skills, he says he's so marvellous at that. Um, are the hardships he has to endure? Mm. Oh, rubbish, isn't it? I mean, and the hammocks he has to sleep in? He doesn't that one win! Anyway, um, that aside, it was an absolutely wonderful talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah with, with brilliant pictures, I know Colin. With lovely pictures of Colin. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it's so great to, uh, to put a face um, and faces to the names of the people that Colin yeah. talked about from the little ship club. Um, the brigadier this and the major this. And, this and, this. and, and now we know what you look like. So, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, I just have one little uh, query about his date of birth. I'm sure he said he was born in 1954, you know. <laughs> 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 He's celebrated that day yeah. three times now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Martin, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, thank you to all the supporters that came with you. And uh, perhaps we could show our appreciation in our normal way. Thank you so much for those who came. Next week.